Today we're going to talk about something that I feel like we are on holy ground. I want to have an added word of prayer before we begin this subject. Dear Father in heaven, I pray today that as we read from your word that we will rightly divide the word of truth. It's important, Lord, to us to know the everlasting gospel so well that we can teach it to others. And so be with us now by your Holy Spirit, Lord. Help us to hear and to speak correctly, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. A new thing. This may be a new thing to some of you. We're going to talk about a new thing this morning, but before I do, I'd like to define some terms. The first term I'd like to define is the righteousness which is of faith. Now, when you hear that word righteousness, what does it mean? You know, we, we have had a definition for righteousness, right doing, right? But when we're talking about the righteousness of faith, we're talking about an absolute righteousness, a perfect righteousness, a righteousness that was seen in the life of only one person, only one human being. And who is that? That's Jesus. He had a 33-year lifespan, 33 years of that. From the conception, from his conception to his ascension, there was not one sin, not one um, aberration from righteousness, right doing, total right doing. In fact, in 1 uh, Peter chapter 2, it says that he did no sin. Wonderful. And that righteousness is a righteousness of faith. Now, wherever Paul uses that expression, the righteousness of faith, it's not talking about my righteousness. It's not talking about righteousness inside of me. The medieval ch ch church taught that, that uh, righteousness was poured into the believer, and he had this same righteousness. But that's not right. When the righteousness of faith is, is spoken of by the Apostle Paul, it's talking about the righteousness that resides only in one life, and that's the life of our Savior. Now, the next one I want to talk about is the righteousness of the law. Paul talks about the righteousness of the law often in his letters. And that ta is talking about my law keeping, because there are two things at play here. We have the Savior's righteousness, which is of faith to every believer and the righteousness of the law which is about sanctification. It's about the Holy Spirit's work in my life, right? My law keeping. And both of them are important. In fact, it's been described like two oars of a boat, right? And if you only have one oar, what, 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 what happens? You know, you just go in a circle. Don't go, it doesn't go anywhere. Then there's an, there's an expression in, uh, that we're going to talk about today called justification. What does that mean? Justification. The medieval church mixed that up with sanctification so that they're kind of the same, and it was kind of difficult to tell in medieval literature where one began and when the, where the other ended. In fact, the Council of Trent met for over 20 years discussing this idea. This was a great Reformation idea. The great protest of Luther and his associated reformers was over how was a man made just before God? Our acceptance with God, how does that come about? Justification simply means to be declared, to be declared righteous. Declared righteous or judged righteous before the law. That's what the word means. Declared righteous. It doesn't mean to be made righteous. Do we see the difference? There's a significant difference between those two ideas. Judged righteous, declared righteous before the law, that's justification, not made righteous before the law. This is where the medieval church went wrong. And Martin Luther stood up and his associates, Baxter and, and Melanchthon and uh, Calvin, almost without exception, they made this distinction. Now, you can't separate justification from sanctification. You shouldn't do that. But they're not the same thing. They work together in, the, in our experience. One is by faith, the righteousness which is a faith, and the other is the righteousness of the law as the Holy Spirit 
begins to carve away from our character those things that are out of harmony with his law. And then there's sanctification. Sanctification is described as, a, as Christian growth, as the Holy Spirit reasons with our spirit and um, begins to make us more and more like Jesus every day as we respond to the Spirit's pleadings to our hearts. Sanctification. We may have some more de definitions as we go along. But I would like to speak from Romans chapter 4 today. Romans chapter 4 is right in the heart of those first eight chapters where Paul makes a big case for the righteousness which is of faith. And every believer in Jesus should know this so well because we have been given the responsibility of carrying the everlasting gospel to the world, right? Revelation 14, 6. I saw another angel flying in the midst of heaven having what? The everlasting gospel. And that everlasting gospel has been in existence ever since there was sin. Right up near the gates of Eden as they sacrificed uh, innocent animals and the blood was shed until Jesus comes again the second time. Everlasting gospel. And uh, the last person to hear <laughs> will have been converted because of the everlasting gospel. Paul in Galatians chapter 1 talks about false gospels. And there are false gospels abounding in the Christian movement today. And maybe even within our own ranks in some ways. Romans chapter 4, one of those special chapters. I want to begin by reading a few select verses. Actually, as I prepared this, I thought, well, this would be just for one sermon. But as I got into the subject, why, I, I, I began to think, well, wow, this is two sermons. And then three sermons. So this might be a new thing, part one today. Next time, a new thing, part two. The next one, a new thing, part three. Because this is a big subject. The basis of everything we believe is about the everlasting gospel. And it needs to be the true gospel. It can't be a gospel of works. It can't be a gospel where, where our works become so meritorious that we somehow, um, you know, uh, like a teenage boy. He wants to play basketball in the worst way. And so he makes a mark on the wall. He's hoping to be seven feet tall pretty soon. When he reaches seven feet, well, he's arrived, right? But uh, that's not how the gospel works. The gospel is about Jesus. It's... And, and whatever the Holy Spirit is, to, is, is able to do within us is very important because we want to be more and more like Jesus every day. We want to be able to witness. That's the main reason. And, uh, but there's no merit in what we do. In the medieval church, in the Council of Trent, the great argument was this. Luther said, we are saved by faith alone, by grace through faith alone. And you know, oddly enough, the Roman church agreed with that. Did you know that the Roman church, the medieval church, taught that we are saved by grace alone, by faith through grace alone? But the poison in the pot was this, plus, the medieval church said this, plus the works of love that the Holy Spirit works in us. <clears throat> That's the poison in the pot. And if you have that kind of a belief system, then guess what? You never know if you are measuring up to where you ought to be, seven feet on the wall. And you'll always be wondering, am I going to make it? I've heard people say, I don't know if I can go through the time of trial. I don't know if, you can, if I can make it or not. I, you know, I look at my life and I feel so worthless. Anybody have that experience? I've had that experience. We shouldn't have that kind of an experience. In fact, let's turn to a text. It's in, uh, it is in uh, 1 John chapter 5. 1 John chapter 5. We can't be having that kind of an experience. We have that kind of experience. We don't want to give it to somebody else, right? We're, we're a witnessing church. We're trying to reach people. But we want to give them the true gospel. 1 John chapter 5. Let's start with verse 10. It says, for he that believeth, he that believeth on the Son of God hath witness in himself that he believeth 
not God hath made him a liar, because he believeth not the record that God gave his son. And this is the record, that God has given us eternal life, and that life is where? In his son. (laughs) Where is your life this morning? It's in Jesus. Um, Hold your finger here and turn back a couple of pages, a few pages to Colossians chapter 3. We're going to come back to 1 John. Colossians chapter 3. Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians. If you have it, say amen. Okay, Colossians 3, verses 1 to 4. If ye then be risen with Christ, seek those things which are above where Christ sitteth at the right hand of God. Set your affection on things above, not on things on the earth. For you are what? Dead. (laughs) Our righteousness of the law doesn't count for anything, really. It is something that God gives us as frosting on the cake so that we can be more and more like Jesus every day so that we can witness to people. For you are dead and your life is where? Hid with God in Christ. When Christ, who is our, what does it say? Life. Christ is my life. When Christ, who is my life, shall appear, then shall we, ye also appear with him in glory. Our life's in heaven. Let's go back now to 1 John. We, we'll look at verse 12 now. He that hath the Son hath what? Life. And he that hath not the Son hath not life. These things I have written unto you that believe in the name, on the name of the Son of God, that ye may know. What's that word? That ye may know. We shouldn't be wandering around uh, wondering if uh, we are in Christ. And that's not not to say that we we shouldn't be saying, you know, I'm saved. But we should have confidence that if we are in Christ, that we are secure. Confidence. That ye may know that ye have eternal life. And that ye may believe on the name of the Son of God. And this is the, what's the next word? Confidence. This is the confidence that we have in him. That if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. We need to make sure that we're in the middle of the will of God, though, right? If we, have his, if we are praying according to his will, you can ask for anything. You can ask for that wall to be moved out. It'll happen if that's God's will. Or this mountain to be moved. Jesus talked about those things. What is your prayer life like? Do you have that confidence? We need to have that kind of confidence in, in what God is to us. So, <clears throat> Romans chapter 4 is the chapter. Romans chapter 4, verses 1 to 11. Romans chapter 4. This is part of the scripture reading that was read so nicely this morning. Romans chapter 4, verses 1 to 11. Let's have every thought in captivity now and, and get the, the meaning of this because this is precious stuff to us. I, don't, I use that word stuff very um, reverently. What shall we say then that Abraham, our father, as pertaining to the flesh, hath found. For if Abraham were justified, there's that word, and it's used consistently throughout the writings of Paul. For if Abraham were justified by works, he hath whereof to glory, but not before God. For what saith the scripture? Abraham did what? Believed God. And it was what? Counted. What does that mean? He believed God, and it was counted it was accounted to his record. God looked at, those as, looked at him as though he had lived perfectly, even though he had not yet. We live in the now. There's a not yet, right? But we're living in the now. And in the now, he realized that the best works that he could do would not work. Verse 4. Now to him that worketh, that is, worketh on a works program, Now to him that worketh is the reward not reckoned of grace, but of debt. You want to really get in debt? Try to get the idea that we're working our way to heaven and putting the notch on the wall until we get to seven feet. That's how to be in real debt. Verse 5, but to him that worketh not. Does that mean we're not supposed to work? No, it means that we are not supposed to depend upon that as merit for our 
acceptance with God. But to him that worketh not, but believeth on him that justifieth the ungodly, his faith is what? There it is again. Counted for righteousness. Even as David, this, you know, these two Old Testament characters, have Abraham, right? Was he a perfect man in all of his ways, everything he did according to the law? No, he fell often. What about David? Even as David also describeth the blessedness of the man unto whom God imputeth righteousness. What does that mean? To David was imputed righteousness. What does that mean? It means that it was set to his account. It was, it can, it, it was given to him even though he didn't really have it. But in God's reckoning, righteousness, the righteousness of Christ was imputed to him. In other words, God looked at David as though he had never, ever sinned when he was in justification. That's how he looks at us. In the Spirit of Prophecy, there is a little statement that says, we need not worry about what the Father thinks about us, but what he thinks about Christ, our, what, do you, you know this statement? Our substitute. Jesus is the substitute man. He's the only one who can fill the stipul fulfill the stipulations of the covenant, and we receive that through him because of what he did. Verse 6 again. As David, even as David also describeth the blessedness of the man unto whom God imputeth righteousness without works. Without works. What does that mean? Without his works of keeping the law. Saying, blessed are those whose iniquities are forgiven and whose sins are covered. That's a definition of justification. Blessed is the man to whom the Lord will not impute sin. Cometh this blessedness then upon the circumcision only, or upon the uncircumcision also? For we say that faith was reckoned to Abraham for righteousness. How was it then reckoned? When he was in circumcision or in uncircumcision? Not in circumcision, but in uncircumcision. And he receives the sign of circumcision, a seal of the righteousness, and here's this expression, the righteousness of faith in the doing and suffering of somebody else. Spirit of Prophecy says this will humble the glory of man in the dust if we really get it. In another place, it's written, not one in 100 understand this blessed truth that was brought to this church in 1888. Not one in 100. And it also is written a page or two away, that when we really get it, the power of Satan will be broken in our lives. How many want that experience where the power of sin is broken in your life? You can't have it by a works program. Doing and doing and doing. Trying harder and harder. How many have had that experience? I've had that experience. I raised my hand. We all start that way. We start at Sanya and we end up somehow at the cross, right? Just like the children of Israel did. Begins at Sinai. In the Review and Herald years ago, there was an article from Sinai to Calvary. I've looked, I've, I've looked through my things. I thought I was going to save that one. It was a good one. From, that's we all start there, right? We think we have to be good. We don't have to be good, my friends. We will be good according to our abilities as the Holy Spirit works through us. If we, if we really get the idea of the central article of justification by faith. We will have the desire to run the way of God's commandments. Like David will say, rivers of waters run down my cheeks because they have made void God's law. That's how we will look at the law. No one who is justified by faith will, will speak disparagingly of God's law. But they will rejoice in it because it's to them a revelation of God's character. On down, down verse 17 to 20. Kind of uh, remember these because we're going to talk about this in a little bit. As it is written, I have made thee a father of many nations. When did God say that I'm going to make you the, I, I make you the father of many nations? When did he say that? He didn't say it after Isaac was born. <laughs> he said it before. Before. Him whom he believed, even God who quickeneth the dead and calleth those things which, not, which, are not, which be not as though they were. 
God looks at every one of us as justified believers, and he sees us as walking on the sea of glass, totally overcomers. He looks at us that way. And we're going to talk about that in a little bit. This is not rose-colored glasses on God's part. Who against hope believed in hope. You know, this word hope is used in the Bible quite a bit. It's a, ver- it's a noun, not a verb. It's not we hope something's going to happen. Hope is a noun. It is the, the blessed hope in Titus 2.13. The coming of the great God and our Savior Jesus Christ it is the blessed hope. It's something we can, it's something with substance. That he might become the father of many nations. According to what was spoken, so shall thy seed be. And being not weak in faith, notice this word faith again, the righteousness of faith. And being not weak in faith, he considered not his own body now dead. When he was about a hundred years old, neither yet the deadness of Sarah's womb. God waited for this miracle to happen after Abraham himself was dead, as far as procreation was concerned. Verse 20, he staggered not at the promise of God through unbelief, but was strong in faith, giving glory to who? God. Now let's drop down to 22 to 25. And therefore it was imputed to him for righteousness. His faith was what? Imputed to him, credited to him for righteousness in God's reckoning, although he was not yet there. Isaac hadn't even been born yet. Can we relate this to our our personal experience with God? The promise made to Abraham and the promise he makes to us of salvation through faith alone? Verse 22, and therefore it was imputed to him for righteousness. Now it was not written for his sake alone that it, that it was imputed for, to him, but for what? Us also to whom it was imputed if we believe on him that raised up Jesus our Lord from the dead, who was delivered for our offenses and raised again for our what? There's that word again, justification. 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 And uh, we could read verse, first verse of chapter 5. Therefore, being justified, what, what tense is that? Present, right? Therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. How do you have that peace, that, that confidence, that, that God loves you and he accepts you? We have it through this wonderful provision of justification. And I have to tell you, we need that as much at the end of the Christian pathway as we do at the beginning. We need it all the way through. Our faith walk. It's a walk and not a work. It's a walk and not a work. Um, There's an interesting text. I can call it up here. It's John chapter 6. John chapter 6. Verse 39. I don't have it. Here's what it says. The work of God is that you believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. Some of you know where that is. Maybe it's Matthew 6. Pardon me? Oh, it's 29. Okay. John 6, verse 29. Oh, yeah, that's right. I had 39. And Jesus answered and said unto them, This is the work of God, that ye believe on him that he has sent. This is the work of God. Belief, that's the work. From start to finish, that's the work. The Holy Spirit comes in then. When we give our hearts to Jesus, the Holy Spirit comes in. You know what he does? He softens our hearts. He gives us a willingness, a desire to run after the way of God's commandments. But it isn't in one burst of energy all at the same time, right? Nobody's perfect. Perfection does not come in the normal process of conversion one day and 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 then you're perfect. No, it's the process. It's the work of a lifetime. Aren't you glad he gives us a lifetime? 
You know, 70 years plus or minus isn't very long. We don't have very long. If by reason of strength, you might get to be 80, 83. As the Lord is doing, not mine. So, why is this chapter, chapter 4 of Romans, so special? It spells out in great detail, using Abraham and David as examples. God's way of accepting and receiving us into his plan using these two Old Testament characters, David and Abraham. Paul puts Abraham here on the witness stand. Abraham was found righteous in God's eyes because he believed God. That was why he was righteous in God's eyes. That's not the basis upon which he could be justified. That's the basis upon which God could look at Abraham and say, I'm looking at you as though you had never ever sinned. I think in the little book, Grace Abounding, I'm not sure about this, John Bunyan wrote, he looks at us as though we had spoken like he spoke, lived like he lived, because he is my substitute. And that comes at the beginning of the Christian pathway. And more than anything else in this world, we want to be what he says I already am in him. What an idea. I want to say that again. More than anything else in this world, we want to be what he says I already am in him. That's justification. That good news or what? To me, that is the best news under heaven. And uh, it's a new thing because not very many people really believe it. I was in a Sabbath school class one time and the teacher said, if you don't be good, you won't go to heaven. Instead of saying, you will be good because you believe. Those two go together in that fashion. Abraham believed God. Do you know what? Christianity is the only faith religion in the world. And Abraham was not accepted by God because of his perfect behavior. Neither was David. So let's define Bible belief. Belief is not merely a mental assent to the existence of his, of his existence nor his power. The devils know all of that. The devils believe and they tremble when they think about who God is. Lucifer walked up and down in the midst of the stones of fire, says in Ezekiel 28. The devils believe and tremble, but rather Bible belief is such a thing that takes God so seriously that if we put ourselves into it, our actions might even be fanaticism to people around us. Think of Abraham. <laughs> what do you think Sarah thought when she saw two beds empty that morning? <laughs> Abraham the fanatic, he heard God and he believed God's word and he took him to a, to a mountain, Mount Moriah, and offered him on an altar. Fanaticism, yes. Abraham's faith was so strong that it might appear to people around him that he was a fanatic. We should not be judging each other, but rather pray for faith which turns and trusts to the unseen. We could talk about the ancient Babel builders, the last day and last day Babel builders. Babel builders are on the, on the, on the work program again, who do not have Bible belief, but rather rebellion in their hearts to to um, depending on their own often selfish works to save them. And away with such nonsense. Luther, Luther was so clear about this. I've got to tell you something. I might just mention this. I don't know what I say in Visby or here. Sometimes I say it there and I think I... One day I was reading Great Controversy, 253. It said... Martin Luther, who ta taught justification by faith so clearly, I thought, wow, where do I find out what Martin Luther taught so clearly? So I bought his commentary in the book of Galatians, and I found out what he meant. It's radical. It's a message that came to this people in 1888. 
And after that, she could say, not one in a hundred understand it. The Bible does away with human reasoning and, and, re and replaces it with faith, which in turn is one of the fruits of the Spirit listed in Galatians chapter 5. You know, one of the fruits of the Spirit is the faith that we can even believe this. We're dependent on the Holy Spirit all the time. Do you pray for the Holy Spirit? Jesus once said, you don't have it because why? You don't ask. You don't ask. We need the Holy Spirit to have the faith to believe this. And then after, after we believe it and put our trust in Jesus and give our hearts to him fully and completely, then the Holy Spirit comes in and begins to help us to see our infirmities and to lead us in paths of righteousness. But all the while, we have this rainbow over our heads called justification where God accepts us as though we had never sinned. And under that rainbow, we have an opportunity to now to cooperate with the Holy Spirit in sanctification so that we have a fitness for his coming. To live with, in the presence of the holy angels who have never sinned. God's terms for our acceptance are on the basis of faith in the righteousness, the righteous life of Christ that we have not physically seen. Faith here. That righteous character is put on full display for a 33 year period of time, and finally ending at the cross, put on full display, the righteousness of Christ was put on full display for the whole universe to see. And the cross, it'll be seen that the cross is the eternal antidote for sin. What an idea. I'm on page one of nine pages for a new thing, part one. So I'm gonna quit here. <laughs> But we're going to talk about this for a few Sabbaths because we need to understand this. If we're going to give it to somebody, it better be right, right? I'm not into false gospels. I don't want to have any part of that. And we have a lot of instruction. If you want to find it in the Spirit of Prophecy, Selected Messages, verse, volume 1. And I'm going to read one little quotation from that. Wherever I put the book. Here it is. This is kind of an introduction to where we're going. This is page 344. Get it from the Bible. Use the spirit of prophecy as a lesson help. It says here, the religious services, the prayers, the praise, the penitent confession of sin ascend from true believers. What kind of believers? True believers. She's not talking about believers who don't have a, much of an experience. The religious services, the prayers, the praise, the penitent confession of sin. True believers don't do anything that's better than these things, right? Penitent confession of sin. Prayers of praise. They ascend from true believers as incense to the heavenly sanctuary. But passing through all these good works, passing through the corrupt channels of humanity, they are so defiled that, and this is true believers now, they are so defiled that unless purified by blood, they can never be of value with God. Is that humble? The glory of man to the dust? They ascend not in the spotless purity and unless the intercessor who is at God's right hand presents and purifies his righteousness, purifies all by his righteousness, it is not acceptable to God. How dependent are we on Jesus? Wow, totally, moment by moment, hour by hour, day by day. Paul and I were talking about this the other day. This is an all-time thing. Can you pray without ceasing all day long? Of course we can. And I heard somebody this morning say, especially pray in the morning and at noon and at night. Daniel prayed three times a day. But all through the day, we need to have a close connection with Jesus. And uh, the Holy Spirit can work with a heart that will allow that to happen. The Holy Spirit is there to plead with us to do these things. All incense from earthly tabernacles must be moist from the cleansing drops of the blood of Christ. He holds before the Father the censer of his own merits in which there is no taint of earthly corruption. He gathers into his censer the prayers, the praise, the confessions of his people, and with these he puts 
he puts his own spotless righteousness. Then perfumed with the merits of Christ's propitiation. There's that big word. It simply means his mercy. The incense comes up before God, holy, that's W-H-O-L-L-Y, holy and entirely acceptable. Then gracious answers are returned. Wow, what comfort in that passage. So my appeal this morning is that we give ourselves to Jesus every day. When you get up in the morning, say to the Lord Jesus, on your knees if you can, I want to give myself to you today. And pray for the Holy Spirit to come into your life and uh, make these prayers that we give acceptable to God. You'll find that in Romans chapter 8. Holy Spirit helps make those, makes those prayers acceptable. So uh, give yourself to God in the morning. Make that your very first work. Could we do that? Could we covenant together to do that? We have a work in this community. We're trying to carry the everlasting gospel to people. And so this is the prerequisite to that. We're going to carry on here in a couple of Sabbaths about this same thing. But this is extremely important to our well-being and the well-being of people who hear the gospel from our lips.